Well, hey, everybody, super, super excited to be sharing this with you today. Uh, we've got the team from Money Verbs, and we're going to be talking about uh, how we experience money differently and how at Money Verbs, we're hoping to have you do the exact same thing. So I'll have everybody kind of introduce themselves, and then I'll introduce myself and tell you guys all about you know why I started Money Verbs. And then we're going to have everybody kind of share their experience with money and, and what it's been like for them. Uh, as they go through their journey. So we'll start with Jeff and then we'll go to Michaela and Jonathan for their intros. And then I'll, I'll uh, kick off, you know, what we were doing and why I wanted to start Money Verse. So go ahead, Jeff. Well, thanks so much, Isaiah. Hi, everyone. I have 10 years of experience working in, entre in entrepreneurship, being an entrepreneur myself um, at Money Verbs. I uh, lead a lot of the marketing efforts um, with the marketing manager uh, who's on Michaela. Um, thanks. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm the marketing manager here at Money Verbs. I've been working with Isaiah actually just in the startup world for about two years now. So pretty new to everything. Um, but yeah, enjoying it while we're going and doing lots of good marketing stuff. So I'll pass it to Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jonathan Banks here. Uh, I lead technology at Money Verbs, uh, working as a COO there. And I've been in this uh, working with technology modernization, technology development for the last 15 years. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so my name is Isaiah Goodman, the founder and CEO at Becoming Financial and at Money Verbs. And um, I was working a financial planning job at a previous company, was there for about five years. And I found that I was just able to to really be able to help people experience money in a way that uh, they've never done it before. Most people are working with a financial planner and they either feel like it's too expensive or they need to have a really, really high net worth. So what I found is, hey, if I'm going to help people and especially people that look like me, uh, I got to go create my own thing. So I created Becoming Financial about four years ago. Now, in that process, I found still that, you know, either my physical uh, capacity to, to be able to work with a certain amount of clients was, you know, limited um, or there's just so many people that wanted to work with me, but uh, we just couldn't meet at the right time. You know, they could meet with me on the evenings or the weekends, and I didn't want to do that. Um, or my financial planning fees were still a little bit out of their range. So I realized, all right, we got to create some sort of technology so that we can work with tens of thousands of people at the same time and really help them learn what to do. Right. That was the big thing I kept hearing over and over again. I don't know what action steps to take. I don't know what to do. And so, you know, when when we see that in things like sports or music, when you don't know what to do, a lot of times we're stagnant, right? Um, if you don't know what keys to play on the saxophone, you'd rather just not. <laughs> or if you don't know how to shoot a basketball, you don't go out there. And unfortunately, it's been like that for years and years and years with money. Um, nobody teaches us this stuff in school. Nobody talks about it. It's kind of taboo. And so we just we just don't do it. And then we have this negative experience. And that's really where we found, you know, that's what we want to do with money is experience money differently. Now, experience is one of those weird things where usually the only way to get experience is with bad decisions. Uh, and that's kind of what we found with people too, is they make bad decisions with money. Yeah. <laughs> then they get experience. And then they're like, okay, now that I'm 45, I know what to do. Well, you know, you're you're kind of behind already or or you've done some things or made some mistakes that you wish you didn't. So that's what we created Money Verbs is to help people learn about practice money and experience it in a new way. So what we wanted to talk about today was uh, to kind of have our, our panelists here share what was money like for them growing up, you know, maybe how it's changed and maybe even how it's changed a little bit as they've started working here at Money Verbs. So we'll start with Jeff. Take it away, my friend. Sure. Um... You know, one thing I'm very proud of at the same time was very challenging. Originally, I'm um, from a small village in Haiti where at the time didn't have any uh, running water or flushable toilets, uh, but we always had joy. My father was an entrepreneur. Um, he started a, a couple of uh, shipping companies that, you know, did pretty well. And I knew entrepreneurship was important and it was really survival. But at the same time, I didn't know that we grew up in poverty, uh, but luckily, uh, we were able, my, my father um, came here on political asylum, you know, fleeing the country and um, came in and got us three years later in 1997. If you ever saw images of people on the boats coming to America, my father was one of those people. Um, and 
you know, we came here in 1997 and um, I grew up in some of the most uh, under-resourced neighborhoods, first of all, in Hartford, Connecticut, and then grew up in, in Tampa, Florida. And a lot of these under-resourced neighborhoods, you know, a lot of neighborhoods where poverty was a real thing. Um, you know, innovation is the difference between life and death, right? There's so many talented folks, many talented kids, but a lot of them don't graduate college. Like my, a lot of my friends didn't graduate high school. So that's kind of like the background that I have. But my mom was always really good with and very efficient with money. Um, I'll say it like this. My mom and my dad raised six kids and together combined, they never made more than $70,000 in their life in one year, like per year. So talk about being efficient with your money. So my background is one where I um, didn't grow up with much money, but then I also, I also saw how efficient my mother could be with money to the point where um, two years ago, my mom, my, my, my dad retired, my mom's retired now, and she was able to buy a house cash, right? Because she was so efficient with money, even though she didn't have much. And so, um, and how that played a role in my life is I always had a negative view of money because the people who I knew that had a lot of money, you know, they weren't necessarily the best people. And um, I didn't, uh, even when I first started my first business uh, back in, in 2012, it was really hard for me to make money, not because I didn't have a good business or a good product, but it just really felt weird making money. Like as you're making money, it just feels like, uh, is this even the right thing? Like seriously, like money is, was not just taboo, but money was, was felt like it was evil. So I've been on this journey of not only doing my best, but having a really positive relationship with money and, and the things that money can do for you. And so since working at, at Money Verbs, it's been a really uh, good aspect for me in my personal life because it continues to change that mindset in my mind about how money can be used for bad, but also how money could be used for good. Um, so personally, um, even as a business owner, as a, as a startup founder, as someone who's worked in, in the NAACP, where I've done a lot of policy stuff at the state and local level around economic development, personally, I still felt that idea that having a lot of money could be bad. But now um, I think the best parts about it is I get to look at business from the lens of not just doing good, but from the lens of making a profit. And that profit is so important. Without a profit, you actually can't be sustainable. And so um, I'm experiencing money differently. Uh, last, last point I'll make about experiencing money differently. Um, I was able, my wife and I, uh, about a few weeks ago, we went to, we went on vacation um, on a lake house with a couple of friends and it was like beautiful. We took excursions, all those things. Why that's important is because I've never went on, I've never been on a vacation with my mom and my dad. Like we've never been on a family vacation together. My son is less than seven months old and we went on our first vacation together as a family. So that just shows you how the different ways that um, he's going to experience money differently. And so I'm really looking forward. One of the reasons why I love Money Verbs outside of it being a really great product is what, it, what it'll do for people. Um, and because because what money has meant for me and I know how hap how much happier I feel and how less stressed I am when I'm not so concerned about, um, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen next month. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. Man, that, it just means the world to hear those stories and think about the, the impact that we're going to be able to make to people just like you. Uh, Michaela, we would love to hear from you about your story of, of money growing up and what it's been like as you kind of get going into sort of this real world <laughs> of being, you know, an adult and adulting. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I think money growing up for me, you know, had some similarities to some of the stuff we've already brought up. But as I was thinking about just like some way I could could chalk up my money experience, um, I think growing up for me, there was just this lack of access. And when I say lack of access, I don't mean to like the tangible money itself, like physical money, but rather lack of access um, to knowledge or to financial information. Um, so just a little bit of background. I grew up in a working class home here in Minneapolis. Um, my mom did in-home care for people with disabilities. And then my dad was in uh, the National Guard for the majority of my childhood. So he was uh, stationed either in Iraq or Afghanistan or doing military trainings throughout the week or on the weekends for, um, yeah, a vast majority of my childhood. Um, so that's the two ways that we were kind of bringing money in. Obviously, those two things don't generate a lot of money, but it was definitely enough to sustain our household um, of three children at the time. Um, but as I look back, I realize how much my family did not talk about money and how much of a taboo there was around money. 
um, similar to a lot of Americans, but specifically for a lot of working class Americans, people that do not have a lot of money, it's kind of considered like this, uh, this stigma associated with being lower class or not having a lot of money to the point where you can't talk about it at all. It's not, not something that's cool to talk about with your friends like, uh, or at the dinner table. Like Those just aren't the conversations that are being had ever. Um, and with that, there's kind of this, this cyclical cycle that we see of because the money conversation is taboo, we're not having it. But because we're not having it, we're just further solidifying the taboo over and over again in this cycle because the conversations aren't being had. Um, and that's, that's what I noticed all throughout my childhood looking back, but then really as I started to enter my adult years. Um, so the first real money conversation I had was my junior year of high school. I was taking a math studies course. Um, and this course was kind of for like students that had exhausted the regular high school math requirements. So we had a lot of freedom in the, like the topics we were covering. Um, and my teacher just kind of was going in different directions with all the stuff we were doing throughout the year. So we did a two week segment on mortgages and the math that goes into mortgage loans um, and how, how much you should have for a down payment and things like that. And I remember sitting there at 17, like, wow, I know nothing about this. My parents had just bought their first home a few years prior um, and had not had any conversation with me about that obviously and there there was just this huge lack of knowledge that I realized I was like I'm gonna be an adult in a year and I have no idea how to go about buying a home I have no <laughs> idea <laughs> I have no idea about any of this stuff um, and then a year later that that idea like that lack of knowledge was just reiterated in my mind as I entered uh, college I sat down for my first day of student loan orientation and I was by myself. I was a first generation college student, already stressed out about just college life in general and how I was going to navigate everything um, without, without help or without some of the other resources that my peers had. But then sitting down and looking at my loans and not being able to differentiate between, you know, unsubsidized or subsidized loans and understand my interest rates and deferment options and how scholarships and grants worked into my loans and how those things could be paid off. Uh, there was like this huge stress that came with that and this realization that, wow, like I don't know anything about money. Um, so that kind of switched for me because going into my second year of college, I started working for Becoming Financial. Um, so for the parent company of Money Verbs, and I started doing copywriting for blogs and starting just learning about all of like the little terms, all of the little things that I could put in the back of my mind to start to go about my money better. Um, and I think that that like sparked this, this passion that I now have for money verbs for the app company because there's this realization that that gap can be filled for so, so many people, Americans in general, but working class people, specifically young people, people that just have not had access to that knowledge uh, previously in their life, that haven't been able to navigate the financial world or understand um, like, a tangible concept of financial safeness or financial security or just being okay with money. Um, so that's that's the gap that I feel like Money Verbs is filling right now and what we're hoping to do. And that is why I'm so excited for how we're going to help people experience money differently over the next years. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. I, I saw a tweet where this lady had been paying student loans and she took out like a $20,000 student loan and she had paid $20,000 after, you know, 10 years or something. And she still owed $20,000. Right. And it was so frustrating because she didn't know like how the compound interest worked and what the minimum payments were. Um, so you're totally right about doing that by yourself. And uh, man, thank you for sharing. That means a lot. Yeah. All right, Jonathan, we'd love to hear from you about your, uh, you know, past money experience and, and what you're learning here at Money Verbs and what you hope to see. Sure. Yeah. And shout out to Jeff and Michaela, you guys, those, both your experiences are very relatable. Um, and I even think about Isaiah, that example you just brought up, I, I've heard of a $75,000 loan paying a hundred thousand dollars on it and getting just below 70,000. So there's, I mean, the terms can be outrageous on these things. Um, when I think about my money experience, I, it always goes back to when I was younger and I think, just in my household, money was kind of um, 
in a way it was like fetishized a little bit in the sense that it was something that you didn't have as a kid but if you had it your life would be so great like you could do anything you wanted and i almost i still see that in my own perceptions of money and kind of just thinking about how it symbolizes freedom and the ability to have choice in my life right now but when i was younger what it led me to do was to really prioritize getting money as opposed to developing myself and um you know there was always the the end of any type of self-development had to go towards money so like you know the focus on school was always about like i remember saying in school like how come i don't get paid to go to school like if this is my job how come i don't get paid to go here and they'd be like <laughs> your education is how you get paid it's like well i can't buy anything with that like that doesn't give me the skateboard that you know my dad said he wasn't gonna buy for me like so that doesn't that doesn't help me right now so that was just kind of the experience you know we didn't have a we didn't have a ton of money this you know we followed the budget the family followed the budget and the things that I, I thought I wanted or needed didn't fit into that. So it really built kind of like an own self-reliance uh, for myself about, hey, I'm the only person who's going to get this for me. And when I do, I can I can do whatever I, I want. And that was good and bad. You know, I, I think it helped me out from a work standpoint, but also in some other areas where, you know, people of my age would normally be, you know, going to school, doing football and, you know, like sports and extracurricular activities. Those things just weren't as important to me because of the way that I, that I viewed money. And so, you know, I think it's been really helpful to be able to have conversations with people in money verbs now um, to, <clears throat> to hear about how they might have, you know, similar experiences growing up or similar approaches toward money or how they can actually turn their money mindset into more of a positive, experience and well-rounded experience for themselves and their lives as they as they continue moving forward so cool yeah it's so interesting how you know the best way to learn about money is from other people's mistakes because that's you know true wisdom right we're always taught you know you got to learn from your mistakes um but if you make your own mistakes with money sometimes that can really hurt for a long time and so being able to join a community and have conversations like this Man, it means a lot. So thanks, Jonathan. Um, well, what we're doing here is really what we wanted to talk about is how, you know, we're taking experiences like this, we're learning from users. Really mention this to you guys as fellow, you know, people who are starting up businesses or learning. Um, and then we're going to take some questions. And I already see a, through a few questions popping up. So um, when when I started Money Verbs, when I was thinking about this, one of the great things that was was super exciting for me is. Uh, the other people on this meeting here, they're some of the first people that I told the idea to. So Michaela was working with me at Becoming Financial, and I was like, hey, I have this idea of like, we should make an app to help people with their budgeting. And it wasn't just, uh, you know, another mint, but it was like, hey, this this new idea that I've created that uh, it helps people that I'd worked with as clients really actually be successful. So we did some research and people liked it. I met Jonathan and Jeff. And uh, we did a little bit of more research and people wanted it, but they still didn't know what to do. That was what we found is as we asked users and we, we surveyed our target market, they're like, all oh, these tools sound so amazing, but I don't know what it means. <laughs> I don't know what these, you know, this jargon and this language is to even know if I can use it. And so we made a little bit of an adjustment with money verbs was, okay, we have to actually teach people how this stuff works and then provide the tools. So that's where we're at right now. We're super excited for the next few months. We've got uh, some great features in the app. So if you haven't downloaded it, go check it out. It's in iOS and in Android. And it's a, a really vibrant community. We're able to talk about and learn about money. And we're going to have some case studies, and challenges grow in the app, and then all sorts of stuff down the road with a bunch of lessons and future things and simulations. So um, we just continue to test and ask our users, what do you want? What's the next thing that we should add that would be you know, valuable to you? So as we grow down the road, we'll continue to do that and get some feedback and, and um, you know, help people as much as we can. So um, I see one question here asking about starting a business. Uh, I think I should be able to answer that. And then believe it or not, in true startup founder fashion, I got to go. <laughs> so I'm going to leave Jonathan and Michaela and, and Jeff to answer some questions. But I got to go do a pitch that's going on live right now. Um, technically they're in Berlin, so it's kind of cool. I get to do that virtually, but in terms of starting a business, uh, the big thing is Jeff mentioned, 
is you got to think about something that number one that you love you're going to be working really really hard at it so you got to love it you got to make sure that it's something that you can deal with probably every day uh, number two you got to be profitable uh, so many people start a business and they're told you know oh the first couple of years you shouldn't make a profit you put all this money in um, especially in in the startup world it's like oh that's a deductible expense write it off right um, but I think that's the wrong way to look at it. If you're going to be starting a business, you want it to be something that can, you know, take care of not just your bills and the business bills, but be something to where it's like, Hey, I can either help other people. And that's probably the most rewarding for me is now I'm hiring people and helping them with their lives or, you know, the impact of the business helps people accomplish their goals. So if you're going to start a business out there, make sure it's something you love, make sure that you can actually make money so that it lives and survives more than just, you know, the year that only 90% of businesses make. What else? Um, we're talking about student loan stuff there, but um, yeah, feel free to ask some questions, guys. Like I said, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I've got to head out and do a pitch. So wish me luck for money verbs here, but uh, Jonathan, Jeff, and Michaela will hang out for a little bit and answer some questions. So thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys soon. I have a great I have a great one as they're working as a startup founder while during startup week. <laughs> there was a better startup story. Right. But yeah, like please feel free to ask any questions, whether it's about money verbs or about, you know, thinking about money differently, some money experiences that you've had. Um I saw Dante's uh, comment about first of all, congrats Dante on raising um that much money with that cohort, two hundred and ten thousand. Um but yeah, truly like student loans is such an important thing, right? When you think about an investment. Uh, um, one of my uh, the United Negro College Fund has a really great slogan that I I've always remembered is a mind is a terrible thing to waste and talking about how important how important college education is. And the millennial generation right now is the biggest generation in the workforce. And for many of us, we're making more money than our parents. Um, I know like for a very long time, you know, just one me or my wife make more money than my parents ever made combined. But the difference with our generation is. Not only are you making more money, you have more bills. Uh, and so student loans is, is, is a real thing. You, how, depending on how you invested in yourself or if you had the money, to, you had a scholarship, that would have been great. But we're seeing all these challenges that people are experiencing, especially during COVID. Um, and one of, the, one of our research findings was that employees who, um, who, don't, have, who don't worry about money perform better from, from a two to one at a two to one rate. So if you're at work and you're thinking about money, it stresses you out. You're less likely to be productive. Um, so these are some of the some of the things that uh, people are experiencing right now, especially during COVID and not knowing whether we're going to get another stimulus check or not, or uh, or um, whether there's going to be new PPP. As a business owner, you're thinking about money. As an individual, you're thinking about money. No matter what age range you are, and you're thinking about money. And so, uh, please feel free to ask any questions and, and interact with us until you know our time. I'm not sure if, um, and if we don't have any questions, Jonathan could talk to a lot of the technology that yeah. goes into the startup week. Jonathan could talk to a lot of the technology. Well, yeah, and I think I might actually, I, I might put y'all on the hot seat because I think that there's a good question here from Tamara um, it, talking about her daughter asking how she can start a business and how, you know, the comment is, you know, Tamara, are you, your comment here, it says, as entrepreneurs, we have an opportunity to model new behaviors and help the next generation. Um, if you're in a position to expand on that, I'd, I'd love to hear more um, as, as well. But I, I think, you know, when people are talking about experiencing money differently, I'll ask Jeff and Michaela this question. You know, what are, what are people in Money Verbs seeing as a way that they can experience money differently when it comes to business? Yeah, so um, I know one of the things that I have just learned from Isaiah listening to talks has been... Um, Profit first, this idea. Um, I think it's Mike Michalowicz is like the author of the book, but I know that this is something that we talk about a lot in um, in business planning and just going about a business, but making sure that all of your finances are set up so that there's not that worry when you're like actually in the business space doing your work. Making sure that you have um, kind of everything on on automatic. Everything is just working how it needs to work. Um, when it comes to your finances and your money with your business. And then I think Isaiah spoke to um, this question a little bit too, just talking about how important it is to to be passionate about what you're pursuing as you're going about it, because you're going to have to dedicate a lot, a lot, a lot of time, especially 
um, with the statistics of startups oftentimes not working throughout the first five years, um, not getting to that five year or 10 year point of functioning properly, there's like a lot of work that has to go in, obviously in those first years to, to get things going. So being sure that it's something that you really wanna spend all of your time and effort on for large periods of time and something that you're passionate about. Thanks, Michaela. And Jeff, what do you say? How, how do you see folks using money verbs to experience money differently when it comes to um, entrepreneurs looking for opportunities to start a new business? Oh, that's a really great question, John. Um, I think it's about, you know, you think about a flight simulator. If you don't know how to fly a plane and um, you may not have access to learning, imagine if you had an app that was like a flight simulator where you could talk about it, learn about it, and eventually actually practice flying that jet, right? So um, so you'll get a, a taste and know how to actually fly a plane. Um, and that's exactly what we're attempting to do with money verbs is it's not just about learning, it's about behavior modification and behavioral change. So yes, of course, there's all these financial literacy apps that are out there and those things are important. However, one of the major aspects is that community piece. And so with money verbs right now, the app has this uh, community aspects that allows people to share experiences and learn and talk about it. And what happens is you learn when you when you begin to talk more about money, you recognize that it's not it's not as taboo. And then we, we have lessons that are added to it. And then you'll actually eventually in 2021 actually be able to start simulating your money experiences. So I see someone um, being going into money verbs, being able to say, hey, I want to start a business. They put into the calculator how much money they have, how much money they're investing in it, how much money they're looking to make. Um, they put into the calculator. Um, what's their revenue or how do they plan on getting more customers and then simulate it and see what it will actually take to reach their revenue goal. Simulate it to, say, to see what it will actually take to get their profit. Um, so that's the, that's the eventual, um, eventual ad and ads that will happen with money verbs um, or even buying a home, right? So you want to buy a home, you get, you get a chance to put in the interest rate, you get a chance to put in how much money you're going to put down and you'll, you'll go through that simulation and then it'll give you an idea of how much your total cost for that $190,000 home might actually be worth 500,000. And then you could decide over the next 15 or 30 years over the life of the loan, is that a really good loan, right? So we hear about interest rates, but mm -hmm. imagine having a simulation that shows you how that works. And so that's where the app is going. But the most important thing is community and safety. And when we did our research, we found that community and safety was really the most important thing for, for users. And then you can have the confidence to take on the other more difficult uh, tasks with money. That's awesome. That's awesome. Confidence is, is huge. You know, I think a lot of it is about mindset, you know, being able to find a tribe to who you can share a mindset with um, and, and, and build that positivity around it. You know, one of the things that I've picked up about money is that if you have a mindset of fear, you know, fear of, you know, maybe it's fear of poverty or something like that, it's just not really helpful. You know, it doesn't help you you be ambitious. It doesn't help you make, take control of your own decisions. It doesn't help you, you know, take ownership of failures that you had. And so it's, it's really important to be around folks, you know, who you can build a constructive mindset with and experience money differently together. Um, I, I'm looking here, Alex, uh, Burnett, you've got a question. How was that two to one performance measured for employees who worried didn't worry about money? Michaela, do you recall that research? I could I could speak to it too. Oh yeah, sure. So um so one Go of ahead. the as part of doing that research, user experience and uh research with starting with money verbs, because we had a lot of assumptions before we started the app. And at every level, we've had to change what our assumption is back from the user feedback. So we work with this company in town, a really good company called Ecotone. And they were we work we partnered with them to get research all around about money and how money affects people's lives. Another key point that came from that study that we'll be having a white paper later on to talk about is how much money even affects your health. The social determinants of health are sometimes um, more impacted than the physical determinants of health. So as far as it relates to the study, it's really measuring individuals' performance and how they score on the anxiety index around money. So if you score really high on the anxiety around index, the index of our money, and then see how well you're performing at work. Um, so those so those are the ways that that correlation um, goes together. But there are so many, um, there's a professor 
out of, I don't want to like specify this, this particular study that I'm about to mention, but um, cause I, I can't remember the person's name. So our Isaiah, the founder was on a panel with a professor from Hamlin and the prof- Hamlin, um, you know, talking about how there are even genetic markers from trauma relating to money that, 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 go- that goes on generations. So there's even generational trauma around money. So a lot of times when people are just talking about money, it's not just a social aspect. There's certain things that if your parents really struggled and had really hard, and I think about, for example, for, for us in, in, in terms of being, being African-American, the intergenerational trauma that gets passed on. And one of them is trauma around, around money and trauma around actually doing everything the right way. Um, I know, Dante, you asked the question about capitalism. When you think about a lot of times of doing things the right way, and yet there are banks who have gotten sued for discriminatory practices against black folks. Right. And so there's this idea that even if you do it the right way, you still can't win. And so overcoming all those things have to be done in a very safe way. Um, And that's why money verbs is just so important. It's being able to help people think about money differently, because for someone, an experience might be a vacation. Experiencing money differently might be a vacation for someone. For another person, it might be, I don't, I just don't really have to worry about living paycheck to paycheck. For another person, it might be, I want to be a millionaire. For another person, it might be, how do I take the knowledge? I actually had a really great experience with money growing up and I know money really well. How do I take that knowledge and grow, uh, grow money for my, for future generations? So that experience money differently means something differently, depending on how you grew up, depending on your relationship with money. And that's why I like about money verbs. It's able to we're able to connect with people from a, a, a broad range of backgrounds and a broad range of uh, age groups. We eventually seeing this as being something that's offered um, as an employee benefit. Hey, like this is something that you can get from your employer, um, a premium version um, that you can get from your employer that allows you to have more tools and, 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 and more skills. I'm not sure if you're on mute, Jonathan, but we can't hear you. <laughs> That's my trademark is being on mute and talking at the same time. Uh, You know, Dante, you were mentioning capitalism and the wealth gap. Uh, It's super interesting. You know, I was thinking about this this morning, um, just getting prepared for the day and thinking about how capital, you know, when you have capital or the amount of capital that you have, you make decisions about what to do with it. And I think when you're taking control of your life, you're taking control of your decisions and making the best decisions you can you can possibly make. And I was just kind of thinking about how during COVID and and, and how many people have even less access to capital than they've ever had, but they're still trying to make the decisions that are best for themselves and best for their families. And so from what you have, the decisions you might be you make may not be understandable by people who are in a different position and are making decisions based on access to different amounts of capital. And I think that this really just comes into play when you talk about the wealth gap and how that impacts things like education, crime, family staying together, all those sorts of things, all those societal impacts that are related to having or not having wealth and that play out I was just kind of taking a step back this morning and thinking about, okay, are, is this, does it just make sense that when you don't have access to a lot of capital and when you have access to a lot of capital, you'll be trying hard to make great decisions, but those decisions are going to look drastically different because of that access. Michaela, what do you think about that? or Jeff, yeah, Michaela or Jeff, what do you guys think about that? I'll go ahead, Michaela. I've been, Every time he says Michaela or Jeff, I've been kind of yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, <laughs> I'll be that guy. <laughs> yeah. Um. I don't know. I feel like the the conversation on capitalism is is a very big one. Um. But yeah, I think it does go back to kind of Jonathan what you were saying about those decisions, um, and about how you're using money, and how those decisions can be so different depending on the access that you have. But this actually kind of goes back to a conversation that Jeff and I were having the other day just about how um, capitalism isn't, a lot of the times we get in this headspace where we think that capitalism is uh, this evil and that money is evil and that it's not good to, um, to acquire it and to have it and to have the power that comes with it. But with that power that comes with 
the money that we get from, um, you know, building up our pile, building up our money in capitalism, there comes those decisions that we can make as far as how we're using that money and where we're putting it and what we're doing with it. So I think that's a really powerful thing because when you start to look at money that way and start to think about um, the impact that you can have when you have large amounts of money, not just thinking about it's, it would be great for me to be rich and it would be great for me to have a nice home uh, and great to have a, a Jaguar or a super nice car, but also that it would be great for you to have this a large amount of money that you can choose where it's going. You can choose to give to charity if you want to. You can choose to go out and support a cause that you would have not been able to support prior. Um, but just thinking about different ways to think about what acquiring money can mean and what power can come with that and how the power that comes with acquiring that money doesn't always have to be a negative power where you're putting other people down and being up on this pedestal and being a rich person. That's not um, the way that we have to think about it because that's the mindset that a lot of people get in, specifically those that have not had money in the past. It's being rich is an intangible concept. It's not something that we think is okay. And we also associate the, that like sense of evil or of not goodness with people that are rich, with have that, that have that money. Um, so working to, and I think that's what the money verbs communities can do as well, just working to reframe that idea that we have of capitalism and how acquiring money can do different things for different people, depending on you know, what you're trying to do and what your values are and how you want to impact the world, not just how you're trying to build up your pile and uh, get more money than so or so. And that's what, um, and that's why I think, uh, Michaela, that's a really great point. That's why Money Verbs is also a public benefit com uh, corporation. So Money Verbs legally is um, organized as a public benefit corporation. So in addition to having a responsibility to return a profit, um, there's a social good that Money Verbs has to also make. Uh, and I think that conversation is just so important. Like I said, growing up using my own background, I had a really negative view of money. And that's because the people that I saw with money, it was negative. Like, for example, imagine you are, which is, this is a lot of people that I'm about to say, imagine this. Imagine we're wondering what's going to happen with your job. What's going to, as a small business, what's going to happen with your company? What's going to happen with your customers? And then you look and you see that, wow, like, the billionaire index has grown like like Elon Musk has become 70 billion dollars richer or all these other people. And so like you begin to really you begin to really see that. And, and, and the fact that, you know, when you think about the stock market, right. Funny thing about the stock market, we talk about the stock market, the stock market. But there are only thirty seven hundred publicly traded companies. Think about all the companies that exist in the country. There are only thirty seven thousand. I'm sorry. Thirty seven. Yeah. Thirty seven hundred. 3, 7, around 3,700 publicly traded companies. And so when we think about the stock market, that's a small amount of, of companies that exert a large amount of power on people's daily lives. And so I think the conversation, Dante, when you ask about capital, capitalism, it's really more about corruption. I think more people have an issue with corruption, whether it was socialism, capitalism, or whatever it is, this idea of basic unfairness. And there has been this idea of basic unfairness that has existed in our market. And so what Money Verbs is trying to do is how do we do what is right, which is do what's good for us, which is to be able to provide for your family, which is to be able to go on vacation when you like, but at the same time, to be able to do public good. And that's why how we're, how we're looking at it within Money Verbs as a company is we're organized as a public benefit corporation. So in addition to having to return a profit, we actually are obligated to also do some, to, to also do good. And mm -hmm. capitalism is a system that we live in. And so I think many of us here are startups in our business. You, you start a business to make money ultimately, right? Yeah, of course you want to help people, but you can start a nonprofit to do that. But really you start a business, whether it's LLC, whether it's a corporation, whether it's a independent um, sole proprietorship, whether it's a partnership, whatever way, if you're an entrepreneur here, aspire to be an entrepreneur, what, whatever you, however you choose to decide to organize your company, you start a startup and you take the risk and the hardships and all those things that come with it to make money. And so it's actually a challenging question to ask about capitalism in the sense of all of us are here starting businesses to make money. And at the same time, the nuance is we can recognize that 
so much profit and so much money has negatively impacted our society. Spe specifically for me, I could speak as a black person. I could speak uh, intergenerationally. And so I think that's the challenge of this generation. That's the challenge of this startup week. That's the challenge of all of us who are entrepreneurs. How are we going to be different as we continue? Are we going to hoard power or are we going to give more power up? And so I think that question for capitalism is a question for all of us to answer. Very powerful, Jeff. You must have seen that the clock is ticking down. So you're giving a rousing, rousing uh, speech to, to send us all off, off in the right direction here. Uh, there's just a, a few more questions that have come up. I really like this conversation about the 80K kind of limit. If you're making $80,000, you go above that, do you get any happier? You know, we've, we've seen that studied. I've definitely seen that from an HR perspective as opposed to, you know, start being more creative with your benefits package once, once your team reaches that mark because it kind of becomes an insatiable, insatiable uh, need for, for uh, uh, to feed that money, um, to feed that salary after that limit. Um, so why don't we um, take some just parting comments here because I know we're wrapping up at, at 10 o'clock. Um, so why don't we uh, take some parting comments uh, and 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 Michaela first. Yeah, um, yeah. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been sitting in and listening to this conversation, and for yeah, all the comments and questions we've got along the way. I think this has been a really great conversation to have. Um, I'm really excited for the things that Money Verbs is going to be doing over the next few years. So if you have not gotten the app yet, check it out on Android or on iOS. We have it ready to be downloaded. We have new branding recently added. So it's a beautiful app right now. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone. Oh, sure. Um, I thank everyone. Thank you everyone who, you know, really listened to us and um, just not, not just listened, but participated. I just want to leave with this, like, your money future can change. Like for me, I'm a living testimony of how actually life can change. Um, and, you know, for me, entrepreneurship has really been the saving grace for my life and for my friends. Like most of my, the close, most of my close friends are entrepreneurs and not only has entrepreneurship changed life for them, but they've been able to hire so many people and the people that they've been able to hire, they've been able to pay them a great wage. And so for me, entrepreneurship has to be part of the equation, whatever the future um, holds. And we look forward to partnering with you here at Money Verbs and growing and, and, and helping you in your journey of experiencing money differently. And thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, um, everyone who's left comments. Uh, it's just been a brilliant hour or 45 minutes to spend with you here. And you know, thanks to everybody at uh, Twin Cities Startup Week, or it might be rebranded Startup Month now. It seems like it's going a lot longer than a week. But you know, thanks to the team for providing this uh, forum for us all to get together. Uh, please do keep in touch with each other. Um, we see our names in the chat here, and we look forward to seeing you all around uh, Twin Cities Startup Week as well. Keep in touch. Have a great day. <laughs>